Good morning, everyone. My name is Tanya Massa. I'm the Director of Innovation Procurement at Ontario Centres of Excellence. Welcome to this morning's Federal Innovation Procurement Session. It's my pleasure to introduce you to organizations who are partners in the innovation ecosystem in Canada. For those who'd like to get involved in the online discussion and across social media, please use hashtag OCE Discovery. Our first presentation is from Amber Musso, the Manager of External Relations at Innovative Solutions Canada. If you have any questions, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the presentation uh, to ask those questions. And a warm welcome to Amber. Every day, the Government of Canada and its partners face new challenges in everything from technology to agriculture to defence to services for Canadians and much more. We're taking a new approach to confront these challenges head-on. Introducing Innovative Solutions Canada, Challenge Meets Opportunity, a $100 million program that enables innovators and entrepreneurs to think big. With over 20 federal departments and agencies regularly posting challenges, this is an unprecedented opportunity to develop groundbreaking solutions, grow your business, and set yourself up for success. Visit us online to take on one of our challenges. We want to work with you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out to hear from us this morning. My name is Amber Musso. I'm the Manager of External Relations for Innovative Solutions Canada. Uh, so you may not have heard of Innovative Solutions Canada because we're a brand new Government of Canada program just launched in December 2017. We're part of, uh, we were announced in Budget 2017 as part of the Innovation and Skills Plan and the program is founded under Innovation, Science and Economic Development, previously Industry Canada, but we represent the Government of Canada in 20 federal departments, so we have quite a broad reach. So I'll jump right into it this morning. Um, so as I mentioned, we were launched in December 2017. We are a $100 million program annually. And I like to underline the fact that it's $100 million annually because that's quite a lot of money to spend. And as I go through the program, you'll have the chance to see the structure of the program. And to spend $100 million annually, there's going to be a lot of activity that you should be very interested in. So Innovative Solutions Canada is taking a new approach to the way that uh, small, medium-sized enterprises do business with the Government of Canada. We're taking a demand-pull approach. And what do we mean by demand-pull? Traditionally, the way that uh, the opportunity to do business with the government is by showing some products that you have in existence already. That's more of a supply push, showing what supply you have and introducing it to the government. We're going to be showing you the challenges that we're facing based on those 20 federal departments, and we'll look to small, medium-sized enterprises to come up with the solution together. And that's where we want to pull the innovation from those garages, from those basements, from those academic institutions where we can actually work together to commercialize it and offer it as a potential solution to the Government of Canada. So we're very excited to offer that approach and very excited to be starting to work with small, medium-sized enterprises that haven't traditionally worked with the government in the past. So the 20 federal government departments, as I mentioned, um, we're representing 20 of them and they are mandatory participants in our program, which is a really neat aspect of the program. Also, the way that we've come up with the $100 million is by looking at their intramural as well as R and, sorry, intramural R&D and procurement budgets. And we're asking them to set aside 1% of those budgets to put towards this $100 million. So just to give you a sense of how the program is funded, as well as the amount of partners that you could potentially be working with. So the concept. Basically, we're looking to work with small, medium-sized enterprises from the very beginning to work together with the Government of Canada to develop solutions to really have access to cutting-edge technologies and push the innovation ecosystem here in Canada. So we want to fund your innovation. So I'm going to start with some neat features of the program just to make sure that I'm keeping you guys awake here on a Tuesday morning. So this program is uh, based on contracts and grants. So this is not a repayable contribution, it is not a loan. So once again, it's a contract or a grant. Also, the intellectual property that is generated throughout this program remains with the business, which is a really neat aspect of this as well. And lastly, all the equity that you have in your company remains with you and your company. We're not looking to take any equity in the company. 
So getting into this program sends a very powerful signal to potential investors, and those are just some key highlights that I wanted to put up front to keep you guys interested, and I'll show you the structure of the program shortly, so that way you can make sense of what some of these statements are saying. 20 federal departments. Once we go through that list, you'll see that we cover a wide range of economic sectors. So the opportunities are going to be vast. Once you leave here, we'll ask you to go onto our website and check out some of our past challenges and also sign up for a newsletter because we have a new batch of challenges that will be posted shortly. And so by going onto the website, you'll see our first six challenges that were out there. And they're pretty specific. But if you look at the departments that we represent, the types of challenges that will be posted are really quite vast and really cover almost all economic sectors. So it's quite an exciting program to be a part of. Also, a couple of neat aspects of the program. Not only are we going to be providing you with funding, but we're also providing room to test and information. So from the onset, whenever you apply to our program, you'll be partnered with a department, a federal department, who will give you access to all of these different aspects. Okay, now the nuts and bolts of the program. I know it's quite difficult for you to see this slide, so I'm going to do my best to walk you through this. So as I mentioned, this is a challenge-based program. We work with the, federal, the 20 federal departments to figure out what challenges that they're facing. Once we know the challenges that they're wanting to, to pursue, we do our best market research to make sure there's nothing currently in the marketplace. If there's nothing in the marketplace, we take that challenge and we post it to you, the small, medium-sized enterprise community. And we're starting at really low technology readiness levels. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what a technology readiness level is, also referred to as TRLs commonly, it's a span that runs from one to nine. And one essentially is an idea, and nine is all the way through to commercialization. The entry point into this program is between one and four. And so what that means, it's from idea to proof of concept stage. So we're not looking for existing solutions. We're looking to partner it from the very beginning to work together to develop those solutions together. So once you see the challenges that are posted on our website, if you have an idea on how to, pro how, how to solve that challenge, we would want you to apply to our program. And I believe most of you have your brochures in the audience. If you open the brochure to the middle page, you'll see the phases that I'm discussing as you go through, just to give you a, a, a better way to reference the information. So as I mentioned, you apply to one of our challenges. If, ch if your idea is selected, you would move into phase one. Phase one is up to $150,000 for up to six months to develop a proof of concept. Should that proof of concept be successful, you move into phase two, where it's up to $1 million for up to two years to develop a working prototype. Should that, be, should that prototype be successful, it would move into phase three, which is really concentrating on opportunities for commercialization, where the Government of Canada may be your first purchaser. So because you've solved one of our Government of Canada challenges, we would obviously want to purchase the solution that uh, goes along with solving that challenge. So the opportunity is really quite great. A few other things that are interesting in this program, we recognize by, by putting this program in place that we're really looking to help scale and grow companies in Canada. So by having these opportunities presented to you, we're hoping that companies will look at their existing capabilities, potentially pivot their capabilities and start new product lines. But in order to do that, you may not have all the capabilities that you need. So we've built in the opportunity to partner into our program. So in phase one of the program, so that $150,000 that we've discussed, up to one third of the funding can be used towards partnerships. And that can be partnerships with another company, partnerships with a university or academic institution. In phase two, 50% of the funding, so that $1 million we discussed, 50% of that can be used towards a partnership. So it's a really neat opportunity to grow your company, but also leverage all of the wonderful resources that we have here in Canada. Additionally, intellectual property. We talked about how that remains with the company. We also want to help set up companies in the best way possible to move forward with IP strategies. So we aim to have 100% of the companies who participate in our program be educated on intellectual property. As well, intellectual property is an eligible expense within our program, which is a really neat and unique feature of the program. So of the funding that you've received, you can use that towards your IP strategy. Also, what we're looking to do is we recognize that innovation is not always successful on the first try. Um, so we've built in a gated process to help reduce some of that risk. Additionally, we know that maybe the $1 million in phase two might not be enough funding. 
and maybe additional funding and room to test is required. And so we're working very closely with the Build in Canada Innovation Program to make sure that there's a streamlined process in place to reduce some of the burden and help to create a continuum in the innovation space within the Government of Canada. So we're very excited about this program. Um, we will be accepting questions at the end, so I'll make sure that I take some time um, and I'll just move on from this slide, even though I'm not sure how many of you can even see that one. So through this program, we're really hoping to grow Canadian businesses. We're looking to help foster some business research collaborations, and we're also encouraging uh, participation from underrepresented groups. So who's eligible? So I've referenced small business and small medium-sized enterprises throughout this, uh, throughout this process. Throughout the documentation, you'll see us refer to eligible participants as small business. The way that we're defining that is uh, you must be for-profit, incorporated in Canada, whether it's federally or provincially, also have less than 500 employees. So in other words, 499 employees or below. And the reason why we're talking about this as small business is because it allows us to leverage many of the small business set-asides in some of our international trade agreements. And so the United States actually uses the same definition, and so we are going to be using the same definition here. One thing I failed to mention at the beginning of the presentation is the fact that this is modeled very closely off of the United States Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR. That program has been in existence for approximately 35 years and has seen great success in scaling and growing companies in the United States. And we've heard very loud and clear from innovators across Canada that they want this type of program here in Canada and we are very excited to say that we are now here. And so by using the same definition, it puts us on the same playing field as the United States. Also, you'll see in the eligibility that there's a few items here that talk about um, having a presence here in Canada. We recognize also that some companies will not be 100% here in Canada, and so we just want to make sure that there is a predominant presence here, and there's also an 80% Canadian content rule that applies. So each of our challenges, right now we're a brand new program, so we haven't set our service standards yet for the amount of time that each, um, each application will be posted, and we haven't set our turnaround time for how evaluations will go. But our aim is to have um, challenges posted on a monthly basis, and we're building our pipeline right now to do so. So our next wave of challenges will actually be coming in the coming, month, or in the coming weeks, my apologies, so we're hoping to have them within the next month. So the way that you can get this information, rather than having to check our, our website um, every day, is that you can sign up for a mailing list. And on the mailing list, you'll just have to put in your email, very, very simple, and we'll push information to you. But we'll only send you information whenever new challenges are posted, or if there's a major event that you may want to come and see us, like OCE having us here today. Um, and so you won't have to worry about your inbox being filled. But what we can say is that whenever you do receive an in email from us, you'll want to open it and read it because you'll see the opportunities that are coming your way. So right now our challenges will be posted for a minimum of one month, um, but we're working on the exact amount of time that each challenge will be posted for. The 20 participating departments. So if I go back to that brochure that you have in front of you, if you turn it onto the back side of it, you'll see a list of these 20 federal departments. So we have a variety of different partners, so I'll even I'll mention um, the two speakers that are going to be coming after me. We have partners such as Department of National Defense. We also have Public Service and Procurement Canada. We have Environment Canada. We've got Global Affairs, Health Canada. So just to mention a few of our partners, it really does span a quite, uh, quite a large range of economic sectors. Just a quick slide on how some of those economic sectors may look. And as I mentioned, our program is modeled off the United States SBIR program. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that program, this slide just gives you a quick understanding of some of the really great successes that they've seen um, over the 35 years that they've been in existence. Now, I will also say they have been in existence for 35 years, so we ideally will exceed many of these growth targets, but it may take us a little bit of time to get there. So I'll, so I'll pause there. Um, you can see our contact information here. If you have any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to contact us. This program is brand new, as I mentioned, so feedback will be key. We want to hear from small businesses across Canada to let us know how the program is doing. This is an opportunity for us to get it right and make sure it works well. So if you have any comments, good or bad, we'd be pleased to accept them. So if this is an appropriate time, I'd be happy to receive any questions that you may have.
Well, well, less of a question, more of a congratulations. This is exactly, I think, a missing link in all the government funding programs out there on really how to jumpstart this uh, new innovative ideas and technology. So uh, it's terrific to, to see that you guys have been responsive and have this program up and running. It's very exciting. Great. Another question, just a woo. Oh, great, and I am happy to receive those things. And again, hearing from innovators across Canada, that's how we find out that these things are needed here in Canada. So once again, feedback is key. We'll definitely take the positive feedback, but uh, understanding how this works in Canada will be very important to us as well. Thank you for that. I assume from the way you've described it, it's continuous applications. You don't have windows. You you can apply at any time to this program? Uh, actually, it is a window. It will have windows based on it. So um, you need to respond to a specific challenge. So we recently had six challenges that were open that recently closed. It just actually last week or the week before. And our next wave of challenges will be open in the next coming weeks and hopefully by mid-May. And so you need to respond to a specific challenge. And within that challenge, they will, that, they will be open for at least one month. But as soon as you go on and see the challenge, you'll be able to see the deadline for each one. But what we, so as I mentioned to you, $100 million in the example I gave you. So we talked about $150,000 and we talked about a million dollars. If you take that example and divide it into $100 million, there are a lot of challenges that are going to need to be posted every year. And so we're looking at having over 100 challenges a year and we've only posted the first six. So just to give you a sense that there will always be, we're aiming to have a pipeline that'll, of challenges that allows us to always have a challenge open on our website. So that way when you come in and you want to see what's kind of stocked on the shelves, there'll always be something that's available to you. Um, but they will be having deadlines and they will close and then we'll, we'll move on with the next wave. Can you give some examples of the six that uh, you've, that have come forward today? Absolutely. So the six I'll do from the, my memory because I don't have them in front of me. So we were looking at things like connected vehicles and engineered surfaces. Those two were from the National Research Council. So from my very limited understanding on those is we, lo we were looking at um, the way of autonomous vehicles and how there will be sensors and how they speak to one another and there needs to be a way to kind of contain those. You can go on our website and look at the detail of each challenge because I won't do a great job in describing them in detail, but they still are available for you to view. Uh, engineered surfaces was around having um, um, a building material that allows you to better contain Wi-Fi signals. There was also a challenge around 3D printing and metal bed, metal bed metal bed powder density. Um, so basically when 3D printing and there's, there's the printing that takes place, there's a need to measure consistency in the printing specifically around um, metal bed powder. I'm, I'm mixing up the words, but forgive me. Um, and so that was from the National Research Council. My apology. The first two that I mentioned were from the um, from I said from Innovation Science and Economic Development that were out of our Communication and Research Center. We also had two from D&D. One talked about protective ensembles for military personnel whenever they find themselves in either bio or chemical hazardous environments. Currently, they need to remove themselves and put on some sort of kit. Um, and so the challenge was around, is there some sort of material or coating that can go into their uniforms that will allow them to withstand the environment um, for a longer period of time? <clears throat> The last one from them was the beyond the line of sight communication, and that kind of goes and explains itself a little bit. How can you remain in communication whenever you're beyond the line of sight? And I believe there's another one that I'm missing, and it'll come back to me, and when it does, I'll be able to let you know what that one was. Okay. I guess the challenge is to try and get the word out to the entrepreneurs that are developing the ideas around it. That's correct. I, I think you can probably do it somewhat through the associations, but when you're talking small enterprises, you may not always be able to find the individuals that are interested in those ideas at that particular point in time. That's right. We're, we're, uh, we've been hearing loud and clear that that's exactly the, the right point. You need to kind of hit the ground and get out there and talk to small businesses. So since launching in January, we've been traveling the country. I think we've crisscrossed it now at least two times. Um, we're leveraging uh, the different networks that currently exist, such as associations, incubators, accelerators, um, our you know, provincial colleagues as well, um, to get the word out. But that's essentially it. We need to have people who are aware of the program. That will really help to generate really great, high-quality applications, as well as create a really good competitive environment here in Canada. 
Specific to those challenges, the new ones, uh, yes. we're in a renewable energy storage, which is a lot of issues around that. Yeah. If the next set doesn't have that, is there a way to suggest yes. a challenge to you guys? So right now we're working on actually setting it up on our website, but there will just be a very generic form that you can just fill out. You don't have to register for an account or anything like that. Um, and we'll have some options there that you can kind of help us filter who might be the best people to send it to. And then what we can promise that we'll relay that information. But wh if whether or not that turns into to a challenge is a bit outside of our control, but we're also looking at ways that we can travel across Canada and bring federal public servants with us to meet many of these companies. Because although um, the federal government has a great wealth of information, by speaking with many of the small, medium-sized enterprises, they may be able to learn new things and push the envelope. And so we're looking at setting up various different events across Canada in the coming year to many years um, that would allow public servants to come with us on the road to be able to speak with small businesses to get a better sense of what's happening. So right now the functionality on the website, the question um, was bringing it back to the website. We don't have the web form set up, it'll be in the coming weeks, but as you see on your brochure, we do have solutions at Canada.ca, that is our web, uh, that's our uh, email address. And so, oh, I'll just go back one. There we go. Solutions at Canada.ca is our website, or is our email address, and that will allow you to suggest a, a, a potential challenge to us. We're a very small team, so it's not a black hole. We hear that often. It's a generic email address. There are a few of us that check that on a regular basis, including myself personally. Uh, some of the numbers I'm seeing of up to 499 employees in a, in a budget that uh, might be a million dollars per project seems to me you're aimed at medium-sized enterprises not small enterprises so what's the opportunity for a small startup uh, half a dozen employees that needs a hundred thousand dollars or so so that's a great question. So that, that's a maximum is 499. Um, we looked at the United States and the average size company that applied to the program is actually nine employees. And so we're actually seeing very similar type of figures that are coming in um, as we go through our first round of applications. So it's more of a maximum than it is us targeting the medium size. We're encouraging small and medium sized companies who haven't traditionally felt comfortable doing business with the government of Canada. This is a, um, what we hope is an easier program for them to be able to access those opportunities and have the proper support. Our application process is relatively streamlined. It's about eight questions and it is character limited. So we're not looking for long essays. We're looking for you to present your ideas. So that way we can evaluate them before making you go through some of the paperwork that's necessary. Uh, another question, forgive me for two in a row, but I think they're related. Um, I'm working on a project with uh, provincial funding on proof of concept but I really am seeing a, uh, a place for this uh, federally. So is there an option to come into phase two if you've had uh, provincial funding for the phase one? So currently the way the program is structured is that the entry point is phase one. Um, as I mentioned, as we go through and gain more experience, um, there's options in the future to potentially review parts of the program, but currently it's phase one is our entry point. Uh, thank you. I just have a question. It's a bit more administrative question. Um, okay. Given the number of projects that you're going to be funding within one year, what are the requirements for the small business um, just reporting back to government? Is it just touch points at the proof of concept or is there more handholding? Uh, that's a great question. I think it would depend on the different phases that you're in. I'd have to go back and ask the question, um, but it's meant to be as light touch as possible, but at the same time, we need to make sure that companies are progressing. We're very interested in the growth of companies as well, so there will be some questions around that, um, but in terms of the program, it's meant to be a supportive program, but I'd have to go back and actually ask on the, the touch points. And for those of you that are interested, I'll finish on this point. Um, I, we've been asked about if you're already receiving federal or provincial type or government in general uh, programming dollars, there are stacking limits. So the stacking limit is essentially you can't be, go beyond 100% of your eligible expenses. And I think that makes sense. So if you're receiving um, fu uh, funding from different government departments, um, you're not looking to make a profit on those fundings. Perfect. Great, so four minutes left, not too bad. Okay, well thank you for your time. And if there's one takeaway that I can ask from all of you is to go onto our website and subscribe to our mailing list because these are great opportunities and they really will be varied in the coming year. And so this way you don't have to keep checking back. We'll send the information to you. Have a great day, enjoy the rest of the conference.
That, that was great, Amber. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, coming to Toronto to uh, share the innovative solutions uh, information and story. It's, it's pretty exciting. I think a number of us in the ecosystem have been wanting uh, the SBIR-like pro program for many years. And I'm just so pleased that the SMEs can, uh, can respond, apply, engage uh, in federal, federal challenges because there's certainly the SME benefit, but there is that, that, that the government innovation benefit as well. So, so that's great. Uh, we'll, we're going to take about a five minute break uh, while we uh, get the next, uh, the next speaker up. So thanks everyone and we'll see you back in just a few moments. Our next presenter is Eric Emé Pantry. He's the out Outreach and Communications Manager at the Innovative Innovation Program, I'm sorry, Building Canada Innovation Program at Public Service and Procurement Canada. If you have any questions, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the presentation, and I'll also have another opportunity to bring back all the three presenters uh, to ask more questions. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Christopher. Uh, sorry, uh, Eric, thank you. Green for next? Yep. Perfect. I usually like the mic because I can walk around, we can have a chat. Um, no, that's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. So thanks for being here. This feels very... Uh, I feel like I'm in a minister, right, giving a presentation. Um, I'm not used to this. I usually walk around and have a chat with people. But so who, just quick show of hands, I'm just curious, because we have, you know, about 25 people here. Who's heard and kind of understands the Building Canada Innovation Program? Okay, so not many. So I'll go through the, I'll go through the presentation. We'll have a chat. If you have questions, you know, and you want to stop me, go ahead, just lift your hand up, and, and we can do that. Um, see no. that's okay no no put it up in a few a few seconds I'll, I'll start so we are I amber first row really no no I'm just joking so we are an innovation procurement program okay we basically we buy prototypes of innovations and we have them tested in real operational settings that's basically what we do in a nutshell so why do we do this we do this to create, to generate economic growth in Canada for Canadian businesses, and we do this to create jobs. That's basically why the program was, was thought up and uh, created about, about eight years ago. So we've been in operation since 2010. Uh, we came, became permanent in 2012, and now we were actually uh, looking to join Amber's program uh, in the not too distant future at Innovation Science and Economic Development. So we have a 40, in our funding envelope, we have $40 million to manage our program and approximately $35 million of that typically goes to Canadian innovation per year. So last year was the first year we spent our $40 million, which was fantastic. We were able to award 77 contracts last year, uh, roughly worth about $35 million. We'll wait for the presentation and I'll get it to you after. So how BCIP works in three really simple phases is we basically intake online application through an open call for proposal. So if you have a prototype, something at the technology readiness level seven to nine, right? A, a prototype that's demonstrable in an operational environment, you submit an application online and you, you basically enter into phase one. So phase one in BCIP is application and evaluation. So we have the National Research Council look at your application for, for some key factors. Is this cutting edge? What does that mean? Is this innovative in the sense that is it an advancement on current technology? Is it an advancement on your own technology? Is this something completely new? So the benchmark for BCIP to get sort of make the team get onto our team and make the cut is what's out there commercially on the market and are you doing something different? That's, a, that's probably the most important factor to get into the program is, is it innovative? We're looking at a, you're looking at a success rate about one in three applicants get through the program right now. Eligibility wise. So, so oh, some of the other things we look for is obviously market potential, your team structure. You know, what you're trying to sell to us is essentially a paid pilot, right? You're giving, give us a, a, your product, your service, 
you're going to outline a set time frame in a test plan, and you're basically going to pitch to us a sale. In doing that, we get a sense of what your capacity is. So that's another thing that's evaluated through our proposals. So once the NRC looks at your proposal and deems you, you know, innovative and you're on our team, oh, there you go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So these are just some, uh, some, some numbers to give you a sense. We've had 472 programs, uh, companies through the program. We've awarded 307 contracts worth 136 million. Some of the numbers that I feel are really important is the 97.4% that go to small and medium enterprises. So we've had companies that come through the program like General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, you know, some of the big players that want, don't need the money, but they want the validation of their innovations being tested by the government of Canada, you know, whether it's the RCMP, D&D, et cetera. But the vast majority of, of innovators that come through BCIP are small businesses. I've already sort of gone, uh, gone, gone through this. I, I was really at sort of how it works. So phase one, application evaluation. Phase two, once you're in, we match you with an innovation advisor, okay? His role is to work with you to find you the appropriate testing partner. So that could be a federal department. That's who we, we seek in sort of the first, first shot to make sure that you have the best partner to validate your technology. But sometimes, like, take the health field. We no longer have federal hospitals, okay? We used to have a veteran affairs hospital. That, that's close. So we can also go to provincial, municipal, indigenous organizations to test your technology. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a possibility now, third-party testers. From uh, submission to, to knowing that you've made the cut, you're probably looking right now, we've had basically doubled our submissions this year. So you're probably looking to hear back within 12 to 15 weeks, okay? That's, that's probably a conservative estimate. Once you hear back, then we, we move on to the matching phase. And that's really where you help us and we help you find you that testing partner. So the matching phase is you sit down with somebody on our team with a potential tester and you basically put together the parameters of what's gonna form your contract. So you're gonna basically write a statement of work. And once both parties agree on that, on the terms of where the testing happens, how many units, for how much time, et cetera, then we take that and we, we, we will bring that up to our contracting officers and they'll work with you on the contract parameters. And then you can start testing. And once you start testing, you can get paid. So we, 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 we pay after we receive goods and services, okay? So two important things from a financial perspective that I like to talk to innovators about and is your proposal is, we want to make sure when you're submitting an application is you're proposing something that you can financially support 100%. You can't consider BCIP's funds coming in as uh, a payment or, or funds to help you commercialize your innovation, okay? So really important is your test plan, the scope of your test plan and what you're proposing to us, you have to be able to support it 100%. The second thing is you have to demonstrate in your application that at the time of application, you have the funds necessary to get your innovation to market. So those are two really important things that you need to consider in your application. I will send an email, I will send the list, uh, a few key links after the presentation, maybe tomorrow. We have an evaluation grid online as well. Okay, and I'll, I'll point you guys in that right direction. Please use that evaluation grid to formulate your responses because we'll walk you through exactly what the NRC wants to see in your proposals. So eligibility wise, um, you, can't, you can have sold your, your innovation, your service for testing, limited sales, maybe you're doing a paid trial, that's okay. But if it's commercially, if I can find it on Amazon, it's not gonna work, okay? So it really has to be pre-commercial. Being a Canadian business, that's a little misleading. If you can be a Canadian applicant for BCIP, oh, you could, you only have to be a business to get paid once the contract is in place. But technically, you can be a Canadian applicant, not have a business, that's fine. Uh, you can be, a, a foreign company can apply as long as they have an office in Canada, a brick and mortar office in Canada. Include 80% Canadian content. So what does that mean? That means when you're taking the totality of your proposal, not your previous R&D, okay? I'm talking about what you're gonna pitch to us as a sale. If you're taking the materials, your overhead, your project management time, your assembly, if you're taking the totality of that context, 
and it averages out to 80% being from Canadian goods or Canadian sources, then that's what we're looking for. Show IP ownership or rights. So in your application, you could be patent pending. It doesn't matter. You can have a patent. You could be, you could have a product based on industry secrets. What we're looking for is for you to defend essentially how you're going to keep your business model going and how you're going to be successful in a commercial environment. Okay. So there can be a lot of variables in that, that formulation of your commercialization strategy, but you have to demonstrate it and you have to explain it. I'll go through the standard in the military priority areas. They're not super important in the sense that they really just help us to find the best evaluator. Okay. The two important thing, the one important thing to remember is for the standard, the not essentially the non-military priority area is we pay up to $500,000. So that doesn't include tax and there's some other additional costs that we'll cover. Like we, we may pay for your travel to a test site. Enabling technologies if you're not sure that's like that's where you fit in okay if you don't fit into environment health or safety and security just put enabling technologies and we'll worry about finding you the right evaluator later on the military side we pay up to a million dollars for military innovations now it is possible that you have a non-military innovation that can be tested with the military that's possible as well so we talked about TRL levels um, and is everybody somewhat familiar with that, that scale? Okay, so we really need, we're really looking for something that we can take and test, okay? So it has to be ready and demonstrable in an appropriate operational environment, you know? If you're working on a little boat and it's ready for your tub, that's not us. We really need you to take that boat and we need to hand it over to the Navy and test it. So it doesn't have to be your final product and we actually encourage you to come in at TRL 7. Why? It gives you a better, it gives you a better uh, opportunity to get feedback to refine your product before you commercialize. And if you're applying at TRL 7, you know, we've seen applications come through once, not be deemed innovative or have, you know, maybe you make a mistake in the submission form, you can always reapply, okay? So if you apply and you commercialize your innovation, then we can't really work with you on a reapplication. But if you apply at TRL 7 and you haven't commercialized, you'll have a bit better sort of window into pre-qualification. So I think I touched on this a little earlier, what we deem is you know, state of the art. So really advancement on state of the art, clear objectives in your test plan. Now your tech, test plan is essentially fictitious, right? What we wanna see is, are you proposing a sale to us that makes sense, right? In the units you're proposing, in the time you're proposing, your, your costing, and can you deliver it? Okay, can you actually deliver on this contract? Because at the end of the day, it really is a contract. So we pay for our testing department, love us. Why? Because we buy them toys, right? We buy them things to try and there is no risk to departments. So this is where a lot of times is we'll use an innovator in their product to, to make a connection in the department. Okay. We have a fairly small team. We try to do the best we can to educate innovators, but sometimes reaching every single, you know, public servant across the public sector is tough. So our value proposition to the, to the tester is that, we pay for the shipping of the innovation, the innovation itself, installation, training, support services, other direct costs, and their procurement. So we take care of absolutely everything. And in, in the direct cost is we'll even support them if, if there's anything missing in their infrastructure and they, that needs to facilitate your test, we'll cover that too. So for them, this is, this is a perfect way for them to get their hands on cutting edge technologies that they might not have the budget for or the opportunity to, to try in any n normal circumstance. So I'll skip through, uh, I'll just talk about additional sales. So we, this is um, just a good example. So Bubble Technology out of Chalk River, Ontario have co has come through the program four times. We've had other innovators that have come through the program three times. Uh, multiple. So we are seeing a value for the companies to come through the program and they're seeing a value in, in working with testing departments. About a year ago, we introduced an additional sales feature. So the first test plan, the, your first contract, we fund. Okay, So the department pays nothing. But we've also introduced an additional sales feature. So you can get to up to three additional sales, can be with the same testing partner or a different testing partner to validate your technology in a, in a different environment, 
Okay, so technically that can bring you up to the $2 million range or the $4 million range on the military side. Uh, and for departments who have the capital, sometimes it's, it's an interesting option versus going the traditional procurement route for something that's already on the market. That's, that's essentially what we do in a nutshell. I have, I have some extra time. Um, I can tell you that right now we're experiencing a little bit longer delays because we've had a lot of submissions come through the program this year. So we've doubled submissions. So, you know, finding out from the NRC that, you're, that you've made the cut will be a little longer. Um, matching might take a little longer and the contract award period might be a little longer. But we're, we're working with our teams to streamline the process. We're looking to collaborate with Innovative Solutions Canada down the road to streamline a process with their program. So I think it's encouraging and we kind of have a good problem, right? We have, we have a lot of demand. So our message up the chain is that there's, that there's a lot of Canadian innovators out there that see a, a strong value proposition for BCIP. So they want the help to get to market as a, we might not end up being your first buyer, but we'll be a buyer. And for a lot of companies is that extra credibility that a sale to the government of Canada can bring. We see it time and time again on the military side where we're testing a product and shortly after, you know, UK is testing it, the UK military or the US military wants to test it as well. So we're likely going to, so our current call for proposal ends May 24th. We've extended the call. So if you're sitting there, you have a, a prototype, you think you're ready for an application, I'm going to ask you guys to apply before the May 24 deadline because we're not necessarily sure when the next call will open. Will it be right after? Will it be a little later on the summer? Will it be in the fall? So we're evaluating the pipeline that we currently have and determining sort of our path to making sure that every company that comes through the program is well supported. So I encourage you to, to, to apply. Uh, I'll take questions and questions? Question? Oh, you'll get a mic. Wait, she got a mic? I didn't get a mic? No. Oh, okay. Do you um, have to have an IP or patent before you apply to the program? Like, where do companies have to be in terms um, of their progress? Like, could a startup company that has kind of created this product and tested it or have a prototype or minimum viable product bring something to you? Or, or what are you Absolutely. really looking for? Does this work? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. Yes. So you, you can be in startup mode. We've seen some startups come through the program. Where startups seem to, I won't say fail, but startups need to realize that we're gonna look at what you can deliver on, okay? So you don't have to, you, you, the company doesn't need to be pre-revenue. The innovation just can't have been sold commercially, okay? Oh, okay? So if you have something really interesting, bring it to the table. Now make sure when you're outlining the scope of your test plan, that you're not overextending yourself from a financial point of view and from a human resource point of view, okay? Because we want to make sure that you can deliver based on, on what you're proposing. So there can be a quite a, a, a bit of time between an application and actually working on the, a contract, okay? So there's a span there. So we realize that. So the NRC is looking at your test plan from a feasibility point of view. Does it make sense? Is it achievable? Those things. but. If there's a real benefit to government in testing your innovation, and by the time you get to the contracting phase, let's say you're, you've created some new boosts for the military, and in your application, you, you can only produce 50, because that's where you're at in your startup. Well, by the time we get to negotiate the contract, maybe you've got a VC, maybe there's, you've got a new angel investor, and your capacity has increased. So we have the flexibility to now say, okay, well, you know what? Military now wants to test 500 boosts. Can you deliver on that? And then we'll work with you to phase in how your, deliver your deliverables happen in a contract so you can deliver and take some of that, that monies to, to keep on delivering. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that's where you need to pay attention is the, the proposed test plan and uh, clearly in your commercialization efforts is outlining where you are at that point at the application and what do you have left to get to market. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment a bit on the 80% Canadian content rule. What you said confused me a bit. I thought it was NAFTA rules of origin that were determining whether you qualify or not. And I don't know if that's true, but um, if it is or if it's not, 
Can you also comment on other situations that we often have where in you know, Canadian innovation, there might be a lot of hardware involved. So if you look yes. at it from the point of view of where did this hardware come from, it might be totally foreign, but the software might be the thing that's the Correct. innovation that makes it work. So how do you deal with so that? So think about it as not what you've developed, okay? Think about it as a time of application. If you have, if you have already developed your software, right? There's no, you might not have any more development costs, right? So you're, you're pitching a, a paid pilot. So if you're bringing in, I'll take a drone example. We have a lot of drones that have come through the program. Perfect example. Okay, perfect. There you go. I read your mind. So you might be buying parts from overseas, right? If you're so if you take the totality of your time that it takes to assemble the drone, link it with your software, maybe you're going to give training to, let's say, the na national defense on using this drone in the field. You take your project management time on the project. So it's the totality of those costs in an aggregate way that's going to give you sort of a parameter on that 80% Canadian content. Okay? So it's not necessarily where, yes, where the goods are coming from will, will play into effect, but it's not when you develop the technology beforehand or, you know, you could have been using, I don't know, a software developer from Belarus, for example. We're not looking, we're looking for the, the sale in the future what you're proposing as a test plan. So 80% of that has to, to come from Canadian sources. So if you take your time and the parts are a really small aspect of what you're proposing, then that should offset with your pro, you know, project management, your oversight of the test plan, your training, et cetera. Maybe. Well, does that all have to be reflected in the invoicing to the, the customer? Like, am I charging for the hardware, but I'm also charging you for this training and blah, blah, Correct. blah? Is that so how you get to the... Not in the, not in the application. The application, you're going to give broader strokes, okay? You're going to give a fictitious test plan. You're going to outline your costs, yes. Uh, how much training you're proposing, those things. When you're negotiating the contract, your contracting officers will go into that into details. They'll want to see a full breakdown of of your costs, your overhead, maybe your profit margins, all those things before they get into the con they sign a contract off. And then those things will be reflected in the invoicing. So the pricing is not truly a market driven exercise. It's almost a cost a bottom up exercise to come to a, a price that reflects your cost and they're allowing you, I assume, some profit margin. Correct. It's not like where I go to uh, some other customer and say, well, the market price for this is $150, so that's what you pay. That's right. You're actually getting into what are all the costs involved in getting me to that point exactly. and you're accepting that or not. Correct. Okay. Well, Correct. That uh, clarifies a lot. It's sometimes we'll, we'll, and that's a benefit to government in the sense that sometimes we'll get our hands on new technologies at a, at a better cost because they're not commercially available yet. Sometimes it will get tricky when we're negotiating the contracts because nothing exists into, you know, there's a brand new product or a new innovation and we have to work with the company and see all these details to make sure that we're getting value for the money, but also making sure that you're not, you're not underselling your product. We, we want this to be a, a profitable sale, right? Uh, we want this to support you. But, so that's where we get into that detailed exercise of, of the financials down the line. But that's really like, that's kind of a, it's, BCIP is sort of a gated pro process as well because it's really like, first thing is making the team, right? Making the cut, making the innovation cut, and then we work out all of these contracting details later on with your partner that's going to test the innovation because that gives us the scope of testing, and then a contracting officer that will walk you through that, that process. Does that answer? Thank you. Very, very good answer. Yeah. I try. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I've read that the BCIP wants to be kind of the first buyer into a company's commercialization efforts. So where can, can you speak to that? And also, if a company or an applicant company has made sales, does that disqualify them? Good question. OK. We try to be the first buyer. Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't happen, right? Like our process is not, it doesn't take three weeks to navigate the process. So sometimes what will happen is a company will have something really innovative they'll pre-qualify. We don't want to hold the companies back from selling on the open market, okay? So, but at the time of application, you must be pre-commercial. After that, you might sell, you might have you know, commercial, international sales, it doesn't matter. We still want to be a buyer. So we might, we've positioned that in the past, but we realize that now we might not be your first buyer, but what we want to be is we want to be a major buyer. We want to be a credible buyer that's going to give you market potential, right? That's going to give you exposure in different markets and give you credibility of having 
tested with maybe it's Health Canada and you're, you're pushing the boundaries in the health field. So that's where we come in. Now, if you've sold the innovation in the past, it depends for what? Quantities, the scope, was it a trial? Were you, do, you know, paying, doing a paid trial uh, in software? You're always gonna be evaluated on your previous innovation if you're the industry leader in that field, right? So the benchmark is what's out there commercially. So if it's your product that's out there commercially and you have a new product that you have not sold and you wanna to try to get to the program, then we're gonna compare that, those features, right? Is there a significant advancement on that technology that differentiates it and makes it innovative? So companies, you know, yeah, there's a lot of small and medium companies that come through the program. Some of them are established companies. Some of them are startups. We haven't necessarily kept track of that so far, and that's one thing we want to look to is how can we better help and leverage startups because we recognize that startups of today create the economy of tomorrow, and that's where the scalability potential is for us. And this program's always been about, you know, sometimes we will buy things that government might not necessarily need or, or desire to buy on a commercial, you know, on a, on a mass quantity basis down the road. So the program really is there to help the company get to market and validate that technology, right? So sometimes we'll buy things that, you know, it might be a retail market, but the company has huge market potential and can really drive economic impact in a region. So, you know, you've got, you're gonna see both streams in government. You see challenge-based programs, and you're gonna see open call programs. And, and where we differentiate a little bit is the open call is sometimes we'll bring something in the program that's not necessarily, uh, that, that is innovative, but that their market, their market goal is not to sell to government long term. We might be a nice to have, but you're looking at a retail environment or you're looking at a specific environment overseas. Does that answer the question? Thank you. I think I'm out of time. So, well, we're going to wrap up, but at the end of the next presentation, we'll have all three presenters available to take your questions because there's a lot of good, uh, good discussion going. So, so maybe uh, I'll uh, kick us off from here. So thanks so much from uh, Sergeant. We are. I have a full team on the corner over there in the booth right on the end in front of the B2G zone, and Innovative Solutions Canada is also there. So if you have any additional questions, come talk to us. We're three. Actually, we're kind of six for both teams, and then we can, we can take any other additional questions and go into deeper. Okay, thank you. Great. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, so thanks to uh, Eric Aimé for his uh, great presentation. Uh, I was happy to hear about the, the growth of the program and the, and the uh, increase in, in applicants coming through. That's always great to hear. And also great to hear the, the benefits that the, uh, these, um, these often uh, SME organizations are able to obtain through the program. So in a few minutes, we're going to hear from our next presenter from the Department of National Events Ideas Program. So we're just going to take a, a five-minute breather, and I welcome you back because at the end, we'll have all three panelists available for your questions. So thank you very much. Our final presentation this morning is from the Department of National Defense. Eric Fournier joins us. He's the Director General, and he's here to update us on a new innovation for Defense Excellence and Security, or the IDEAS program. If you have any questions, we'll have time after Eric's presentation, and actually we'll bring the, the three presenters from this morning as well. So uh, welcome, Eric. Woo. Good morning. For people that have been to our booth, if you have, if you picked up this, this little card, uh, with our uh, email address and also our web page address, gives you all the information that you'll see here today. So what's IDEAS? Uh, brand new program, National Defense. Uh, we'll have a budget of uh, $85 million starting next year. We have about 45 this year. Uh, and it's all to access innovation in Canada. Uh, the way it's going to work is for us to identify challenges that we're going to be posting uh, on our on our web page for people to uh, to work with us to solve. So um, access to innovation, uh, eligibility. It's for about everybody, from small businesses to big business to academia to non for profit to individuals in their basement doing some work. The only people who cannot work with the funding from ideas are federal civil servant. So the federal employees cannot participate. Um, provincial civil servant could, uh, municipal also, but not the federal. Um, the deck that I'll be using, are, are, the, are the presentations available after for participant of, to OCE, the discovery? Cause, yeah, okay, because um, 
I'm not going to use all the slides. I mean, there's 28 slides. I'm not going to speak through all of them. I'll use probably five or six only. Uh, but all of them have interesting information for people to have a look at. So um, let's start. So the program was uh, released as uh, the national defense uh, policy last year, uh, the, uh, the strong and secure and engage. However, it took us a while to get organized, to build the program, uh, to get it approved by the government, and to go forward. So we launched on April 9th, so uh, about two and a half weeks ago. At the same time as we launched the program, we also launched our first call for proposals. So there's a call now out with 16 challenges. So if you go look at uh, our webpage, you'll see that we're using one of our tools called Competitive Project. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're pushing 16 challenges to people. I'll go through the, uh, the elements, the tools, in a few minutes on one of the slides. So this slide shows that we have um, high coverage in the department. Uh, our national defense minister uh, talks about uh, ideas and innovation all the time. At the same time, uh, the department itself sees this as a great tool to connect with the innovators in Canada. So why are we doing this? Um, I mean, DND and D has its own labs. We have uh, eight labs in Canada doing research already for the Defense Department, uh, DRDC. But why do we need this today? Well, globalization of SNT is a good example where in the 50s and 40s and early 60s, about 70 to 80 percent of the work being done on science technology was being done in government labs. Today, that's changed a lot. Right now we're talking about maybe five to 10% only being done in government labs. Everything else is done by uh, academia, um, industry, a non-for-profit also is, a, is now a big player. So in our case, to be able to have the best solutions to our problems, we need to go outside of our own organizations. At the same time, if you look at some of the other points in there, we're meeting some uh, adversaries in the world that um, don't follow the rules, uh, do things quickly, uh, pandemics, so the, the, world, the world is moving fast today. So we need to do better at what we're doing uh, in, in, uh, in developing our solutions. So that's the why. And this slide I'll pass because on one side it says why, on the other it says what. Well, what is going to be ideas, and I'll get back to that one in a few slides. But we're not the only one doing this. So Canada in 2018 and on, in April the 9th, we started our new program. But we've looked a lot in the last few years to our allies. Uh, the United States developed a program like this in 2014. Australia and the UK have done the same thing in 2016 also. So we looked at what worked for them, what did not work for them, try not to reproduce the part that did not work. Uh, and um, we now have a program and we've, we've talking with them still about what was their success rate with academia, with small businesses and things like this. So very, very much connected with them. In the future also, we're already thinking about uh, running challenges in, in uh, various countries at the same time. So for example, if we have a challenge here in Canada and there's a challenge in the UK, that's the same thing. We could run the two challenges at the same time to benefit the two countries. So things we're, we're thinking about. I mean, ideas is only started on April 9th, but we have lots of ideas of future development for it. Now, working with our partners, we learn about four things also. First thing, agile business process. It's going to be important for us to go to contract fast, for example. Uh, we know that working for government sometimes, or working with government sometimes, takes a long time to sign a contract. We're talking of months, like six to 12 to 15 months in some cases I've heard stories in the past. Um, my case, uh, for the call that's out today, uh, we want to go to contract in 12 weeks. Uh, so we've developed the processes and the teams to be able to do this. Not all of our tools are our contracting vehicles, so you'll see that when I talk about the tools. But the one that's out right now, closing on May the 24th, our objective is to have all the contracts out by August the 15th to have our next call. Because Ideas is going to be live all the time. We have five tools, five elements, and we'll be using them con continually to, um, to, to connect with the innovators. We have many challenges, so that's what we want to be doing. So that's the first, the first one. The second one, multidis multidisciplinary team. Um, Working together is how you get the best ideas, p p putting different types of people together. And some of our ch of tools that we're developing uh, will kind of force people to work together. Innovation Network, one of our tools, is asking for a university to, to um, organize a group of people together to apply to some of the proposals. The next one is learn fast through frequent trials. And I used to say learn fast, fail fast. Um, one of well, the tool that we have open right now, Competitive Projects, just does just that. 
when we'll, um, for a challenge X, for example, let's say we get 30 proposals. Instead of going down to selecting one team that will win, we'll select 15 and we'll start 15 of them for six months for a, 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 a fixed amount of money, maybe up to $200,000. After the six month, we'll look at what's there and we'll say, okay, 15. Well, 12 of them did okay. They have some good results, but there's nothing special about what they've done. Thank you very much. You've been paid. You've done the work. Thanks. The three others looked at that problem differently. They came on the side of it. They, they have something, a different way of looking at it. Now, we'll work with those people and keep funding them and keep pushing them to develop further. So that's what we say about fail fast, learn fast. So you start with many and you slowly decrease the number of, of participants. And the last one, well, we're putting in place a new program, uh, putting in place new tools, uh, for sure, uh, putting in place some, some pretty interesting money for science technology. Uh, hardest problems bring the best ideas. The problems are not going to be easy. So just uh, have a look at what we have right now on the, on the web page. So the mandate of the program, really, we're going to do this doing three things. And the next slide is about the, child, the, the, the tools. So we're going to recruit innovators in Canada, and you'll see how. We're going to support innovation through some of the tools also. And we're going to make sure that there's an opportunity for um, industry and academia and all the participants to demonstrate how they solve our challenges. So we have a few tools on that. Whoops. I need to stay there. And that's the last slide I will use today. Um, what it is, this is ideas. That's it. Ideas is a program with eight elements, and they're all on this slide. So how do we start? We start, as I said earlier, with challenges from, in this case, it says uh, Department of National Defense and, and Armed Forces, but also security, RCMP, uh, CSIS, CSE. All of those organizations come to us to give us their, their hard problems, their challenges, uh, their priorities, and we start with a bank of, of those. Our first tool is called ideation. Exists in the country, exists in the world. Ideation labs already exist. In our case, we're going to use this to refine the challenges that they give us so that we can submit them to innovators. So it's mostly of an internal process in this one. Now, at that point, we end up with a big bag of challenges. Uh, right now, we have uh, about 90 sitting uh, in a data bank, and we're slowly using our various tools to push them out to people. So there's 16 out today uh, as part of our first call. So we have five tools that we use to connect with innovators, and they're on the next two lines. So the first line, competitive project, contest, and innovation network, are together on one line because they target the same TRL level, the same type of, of uh, development level, so TRL 1 to about 5, 6. The two others, sandboxes, innovation assessment implementation on the lower line, are advanced at a higher level in TRL. So sandboxes is more like a 6. So we have a prototype, and innovation assessment implementation is closer to a 9. It's an 8.75. On that, on that scale, so very, very close to have a product. Uh, and I'll, I'll go to that when I go through the, the various uh, tools. So what I'll do in the next 10 minutes, I've got 20, so yeah, next 15 minutes, I'll talk about the various, uh, those, those tools. So the first one, competitive project, uh, is using contracting. So it's a good old contracting process. So what we do on our webpage, we'll post challenges out to people and say, if you can help us solve it, submit a proposal. The proposals are very simple. It's a six-pager and uh, four tables. Uh, it should take you less than uh, two or three hours to, uh, to, uh, to submit. But the challenges are not that easy, so you have to look at the challenges that are posted. After we, we, we close the, the, the challenge, um, we evaluate all those, uh, those uh, proposals. As I said earlier, we don't go down to one. So we'll stop for each challenge that we have, uh, we'll decide We'll, we'll, we'll keep the ones that are good. So if it's five, it's five. If it's seven, it's seven. If it's 10, it's 10. I think at about 15, we'll stop. But we'll, we'll, we'll want to be funding uh, at least five, six, seven for each challenge to make sure that we have a good bank of projects starting. So in this case, it's fixed money, fixed time also. So you've submitted a, a proposal. Uh, you're ready to start the work. On uh, August the 24th, you get uh, your contract. It's fixed time, up, up to, from zero to six months and from zero to $200,000, what you submitted to us in your proposal. Um, so we go in, we, we start that way. As I said earlier, after six months, we'll evaluate everybody, look at them and say, if you're done, okay, thank you very much, work is completed. Uh, but the ones that were, um, have a lot of potential, we'll keep working with them. 
uh, for a second phase. So we can go up to a year, up to a million dollars. Now, if you look on our web page, there's a third phase to this thing. So I've talked about zero to six months for $200,000, dollars zero to um, one year for $1 million. The third phase that we've been able to develop in the last little bit, working with PSPC, thanks, Amenta, and the team over there, um, is to have a third phase to this that could bring your project or your prototype from material six to nine uh, for up to $20 million. Now, it's um, heavy development. When, we, when you start talking about developing something from TRL 6 to 9, that's a good old valley of death that they call in the development world. Um, that's why the amount of money goes up very quickly. Now, we're not saying that for every call we'll push something in that, in that area, but we have the uh, Canada as the right to say, this one is very interesting. We'll keep working on the development. So we do have a, an end-to-end -end process today to go from an idea, TRL 1, up to a project that's a, a, a product at the end. So if you go on the internet and you look at competitive projects and the way it works, you'll see all the details for this. So that's the first tool. The second one that we have is contests. So that one is, uh, if you go back many years in the United States, an uh, XPRIZE uh, was, um, if you fly a rocket 200 miles, I give you $10 million. I will not be giving $10 million because that's been done already, so we're set. But the challenges are going to be built that way. If, if, uh, so again, we're all working on challenges. We'll post challenges for all of these tools. So we'll post a challenge and say, if you can do this, if you can solve this, this problem, we'll work with you to acquire your solution. Are we going to buy it? We'll license it. But at that point, there's, we're not signing a contract with you, so you're going to work with us. No, we're acquiring the solution at that point. Um, there, there are tools like this that exist on the internet already. Um, Kaggle, Innocentive, you can go and check on their sites where what they do is that they do crowdsourcing. They post a problem and say, if you can solve this, thank you, and you get a prize, and, and that's the way they work. And I think that because we're, we're new at running cases like contests or uh, um, challenges like this, I think that for our first few calls, we're going to be using a, uh, a commercial uh, tool like this to do this. We'll have to see. The next one, Innovation Network. Now we're talking about um, larger problems, uh, things that don't, cannot be solved in, in one challenge, one call like this. We're talking about, um, well, we have two calls ready to go out in, at the end of May and at the end of June. The first one is the application of advanced materials. So a larger piece of work that needs to be done. Now we're talking about setting in place uh, an organization, uh, or it might exist already, so somebody's going to come to us and make a proposal on that challenge. We want to build a network, and we're putting on the table many million dollars for many years. For example, I think the call coming out in, at the end of, uh, of May is for $9 million for three years. So we're really focusing the work on developing capability uh, in Canada for that specific uh, uh, type of work. Now, if there's a network that already exists in Canada and they're working on, on materials in that case, they can apply. If there's no network on that domain, well, people can get together and, and apply for it. There's specific rules about um, the number of players in a network. Uh, it's got to be at least uni one university, at least one industry. So th there's, there's specific rules that will be posted when we go live. But that's a, it's a longer term development that we want to put in place. So that in Canada, we have that new capability that exists for other industries or other partners in defense to use also. So that's the low TRL. So TRL 1 to 5, 1 to 6 for those three. Now we're changing ball, ballpark. We go to sandbox. So we're pushing, uh, by the way, all of those tools are independent. We'll run them, uh, they can be connected, but we're gonna run them individually. Uh, so they don't need to wait for one another to, 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 be, uh, to have calls. In about a month and a half from now, we'll start a sandbox process. A sandbox is an area where, again, based on a challenge, somebody can come and demonstrate their solution. So uh, a good example, and it, it's not a challenge that we will have, but let's take 20 miles by 20 miles in Canada. Take a, a haystack, put it in the middle, put a needle, put it in the haystack, and the challenge is find a needle. So people and in, innovators in Canada will come and try to find that needle with their widget, with their, with their codes and, and everything else like this. So that's the same type of process, but we'll post a challenge and we'll say, if you can do this, come and demonstrate how your widget, your technology, your code can, can do it. Uh, I say code because it could be virtual sandboxes also. It doesn't not necessarily mean to be uh, a piece of landscape that, that we, we will reserve to do our, our, um, our sandbox. So it's for people to come and demonstrate their, their solutions. In that case, 
we will set up the sandbox. We'll bring our, our scientists, we'll bring our military personnel, our, our, our policemen or firemen that we need uh, to be able to, pr to provide feedback to the participants. Uh, we'll set that up. The, the sandbox is going to be free for the participants. Sandboxes are very expensive. In the United States, if you go to a sandbox in, uh, in cyber, they're usually in the order of $25,000 a week. Uh, and it's a, so if it's a physical sandbox, it, it, it can go up to fifty or $75,000 a week. So in this case, free. However, we're not giving money to the participants to come and participate. So if you want to come and participate, fine. You'll register, you'll be there, you can demonstrate, but we're not funding that, that part of the, uh, of the work. It's going to be the, the rest of it, sorry, the rest of it is going to be free, and at the end you get feedback from our, from our specialists. So you can go back to your lab, to your environment, and continue the development of what you have. Our last tool, innovation assessment implementation, we go further in an area that it's, uh, it's very tricky for us, it's the word procurement. In this case, we will procure something, but for evaluation only, for testing. We're not procuring for um, supplying the Canadian Armed Forces, for example, for the, for the next, I'm not gonna buy 60,000 pairs of boots. Uh, in this case, again, we'll set a challenge out, say if you can solve this, and those challenges are gonna be very specific because I don't want uh, 30 people, the 30 entities to say, oh yeah, I can solve your challenge. I want to keep it to one, two, or three, or a very small number of, of organizations who can solve that challenge, because what I'll be doing is I'm going to be buying whatever is being offered from, to me. So we post a challenge, um, one company says, no, we can solve that challenge, we'll work with them at that point to acquire their technology um, so that we can give it to our military personnel or policemen or firemen, whoever will be doing some real testing in the field. So they'll be taking that um, solution and test it, come back with some uh, results, uh, feedback that will be able to feedback to the company. So the participant get two things. They get feedback so they can really finalize their, their, uh, their product. And at the end also, they're able to say that the Canadian government bought one or five or seven of, of their products. So if you're thinking about exporting, it's, a, it's an important uh, piece of information to, uh, to do. So, yep. Now, there are two other pieces of, of ideas, a bit outside of us reaching out to the innovators, and I'll talk about them anyway. Mobility is, is a tool um, that we'll use for call, on calls also. We're still defining how we're gonna be doing this. There's a program called Interchange Canada that allows um, people from industry and, and government uh, entities to exchange places. In this case, we want to take three, or three entities, so government, so government labs, uh, industry, and academia, uh, and see how we can move people around for short periods of time. A good example would be, for example, let's say we have uh, an innovation network uh, call for proposal. Um, a university in Calgary wins that call for proposals. For the next three years, they're working with us on advanced material, for example. A professor over there says, oh, wait, there's a company in Waterloo that is doing some very interesting work. Okay, I'm ready to send one of my students there. Well, we can talk with the company in Waterloo. Uh, they're okay with that. So we'll take the students from Calgary, move them to, to Waterloo for two, three months. Because we think that the best way to learn about innovation is to exchange, to be able to work together. So um, small periods of time, uh, maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe up to six months, so we'll pay for the salary, we'll pay for the accommodations and things like this. So as I said, there's a program that exists in Kenyan government right now, Interchange Canada, but we'll, we'll apply this on, on steroid uh, and we'll try to, uh, to have um, simple rules uh, that will make it uh, uh, viable and possible to apply. So this one is, we're still working on, on defining it. I mean, all of this, by the way, didn't exist eight months ago. So it's all been created in the last eight months, and there's some parts of this that are not quite there yet. Um, as I said, competitive projects, innovation network, and contests, the first three on the first line there, are ready to go, and, and one is already going. But um, we're still developing things as, as, as we go along. The last one is called integrators. And I see there's a funny S at the bottom there that ended up on his own. Um, integrators is something that we, we, we want to... Um, when you start a project, uh, we have a tendency to put project managers, project director, scientific authority, or this type of people around a project to keep it going. Uh, we will be starting lots of projects, for sure. For example, in the competitive project, the call that we have out today, there are 16 challenges. I said earlier that our aim is to go between six, maybe to 10 um, solution or, or contract per challenge. 
we're talking about between 100 and 150 contracts that we want to push out in a very short period of time, and those contracts are going to keep, keep moving forward. Yes, we want to provide freedom to the innovators. We want to want to put project directors, managers, or, or scientific authority around those projects, but we'll put what we call integrators. Some of our scientists, our own scientists, because I mean, I'm from the RDC, so we have 1,500 people working in our labs. So we'll ask those people to to, Sherpa, to, to be a Sherpa for those projects. I don't want them to be in the labs working with people. No, to give it a call once in a while, to, to, um, to know what's going on. So I might ask uh, uh, one of our scientists in human performance, for example, if the challenge is in human performance, to follow five, maybe five uh, of, the, of the contracts starting. So they will keep an eye on them uh, without being too restrictive because it's innovation. So you want to give them freedom to develop things, but at the same time, you want to make sure that if something goes wrong, it can get back to you. So the innovator is going to be the point of contact between us and, and the, 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 what will be started. So really, uh, as, as a term I use a few times, Sherpa, just to hold the hands of, of the project, making sure that uh, it's happening in the right direction. So at this point, I'll stop talking, and we have eight minutes for questions. And after that, anyway, we have another session of, of questions. So all right, all yours. I, I was listening to what you were saying about testing, um, especially the acquisition piece. Yep. Uh, I'm wondering what is the rationale that you use in terms of uh, why are you procuring or purchasing that particular solution versus uh, prototyping it with, uh, with a vendor in question? In this case, um, so as I said, we have many tools. Uh, sand, sandbox is the tool where people will, be, will come to demonstrate their solution. At a TRL, that's a bit lower than, than the last element. The last one, we really want to be able to, um, to, have, to, to bring that solution and give it to people to go and operate with it. So in a case of, uh, let's say the, the solution is a vehicle that costs $20 million, I'm not going to buy two of them. I'll rent time on it. I mean, to, for us, it's really to have access if, if the innovator doesn't, for some reason, doesn't want us to buy it, the only thing I want to be able to do is have access to it so people can operate with it and come back with some feedback. Um, so yeah, in some cases, it might be easier for us to buy it, it might be easier to rent, rent hours on it, to lease hours, so I don't know. But it's the, it's the principle is to be able to have real operators, uh, could be soldiers, could be uh, firemen to use whatever has been developed in real conditions in their training and their exercises to come back and be able to say yeah it's pretty good uh, or no it doesn't work on there so to give you the feedback that you need to finish the design so we're not very tight about buying it but to have access to it okay hi um, my ex um, I have some experience being an innovator mm -hmm. and really an innovator is a pathfinder mm -hmm. And my experience with government is that they're very rigid mm -hmm. in their thinking and they have a very strict parameter to deal with and often they're more concerned about their job than, than being willing to take a risk. So how are you going to change the culture within your own department in order yeah. to encourage that kind okay. of innovation? A good example of that, if you look at the way competitive project works, um, as I said earlier, we go for one challenge. Instead of uh, 30 people make a proposal, instead of going down to one and accepting only one and pushing that one forward, we'll start with 10, 15. After, after a number of months, we will cut that down to a group of proposals that are working well, that are, that are making exceptional development. The fact that um, at some point we will turn off projects um, and after investing funding into that, that, that domain, tells you that my team, anyway, where we are, the level of risk is, has been accepted that, yes, we will start things that might not work uh, uh, initially, and we'll work with more people. So I think that the, the vision that we have, in that team, anyway, is to take more risk than the rest of the government. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about taking as much risk as DARPA. Uh, I was there last week, and we had some interesting discussions about risk-taking. But we will be taking more, uh, and that's why earlier again, when we're talking about um, uh, the in integrators, we're not putting project directors or project managers to really constrict, like, to constrain what people are doing. We just want to make sure that they're not um, getting lost, so giving them enough direction. So I think that the, the tools we're developing 
um, are there to support the innovators, and I think we'll, we'll adjust. I mean, a year from now, if I come, come and present again, I'm sure that several of those tools will be working differently because we'll adjust as we go along. But I, I think we, um, for the risk piece, I think we've, we've, done, we've gone quite a ways. Um, yes, it's a very good program. I think long overdue, and uh, we'll let you know in a year from now if, if I mean, how, how we're going to end up with this thing. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Well, we'll be following closely. And so you launched 16 yeah. challenges recently, and yeah. I haven't seen them yet. But uh, and you said there's uh, actually that's 16 of 90 that have been developed. Yep. Uh, I guess in consultation with D and D itself. Yep. Uh, so but now my question is uh, in the future, and so no doubt th there are many challenges, but. Will you be able to articulate, for example, general priority areas and then allow people to come to you to suggest which challenges you should issue? At some point in the future, okay, so ideas is we're still developing the parts that we have to develop today because I mean, I've got a small team and we're building on this thing. We already have some future design in our heads uh, for the future. One of them is to be able to do what you're just talking about. So flip the table around. Instead of, a of, of a us submitting challenges, it's us to open an area of work, for example, logistics, and say, if you have a solution for this, submit it. Open 365 days a year. I spent the last three years of my life in the UK uh, when they were developing their uh, defense innovation program. I was part of their team. Uh, and this is one of the tools that we developed. So when they launched uh, in 2016, they launched both. They launched challenges and they, la they launch also what they call recur the, 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 the permanent. So open, uh, open areas of work and it, it's, um, it requires a lot of work to manage. And we're not quite ready to do this yet. But eventually it'll come to that where we'll identify specific domains of work and we'll open them. But not quite yet. Good, thank you. Okay. That's it. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go stand. And Eric also. Yeah. That's great. So thank you very much, uh, Eric. You've given us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, and I can see that the rolling aspects of the multi-component can be very attractive to, to companies and innovators. So really looking forward to hearing uh, and uh, hearing next year how, how everything uh, rolls out. So now we have a few minutes uh, to gather the rest of the, the panelists this morning. So Amber from uh, Innovative Solutions Canada and Eric uh, Aimé from uh, BCAP. So uh, Amber, did you want to have a seat and the guys can uh, stand beside you? So now we have uh, um, opportunity to, to take questions from um, from any of the, the, the audience members that uh, may have uh, been in and out of today's session. So if you can raise your hand, that would that would be great, and we can we can get the mic over to you as we're recording this. So while we're while you're thinking about that, maybe I'll, I'll kick us off. So can you give us a sense? You know, this is really exciting times. Uh, these are um, the programs that uh, the ecosystem has been calling out for. Uh, and and uh, not only when we talk about innovators, more broadly the SMEs that I understand that you're, you're trying to engage with as well. Can you give us a sense um, how your groups might be working together now and also perhaps a sneak peek on what you think it, the relationship might be in, in a year's time or year, year and a half time? So anybody can, can start that off. Oh, you didn't ask that question, <laughs> did you? Open the can of worms. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting because BCIP has been around for a little while now. We've been, you know, we're in our eighth year in operation and it's encouraging because I think you're seeing a natural transition in government where they're realizing that you don't want to confuse people with programs that overlap to each other. We want that clear value proposition. I think Budget 2018 just announced that, you know, BCIP and ISC will be consolidating our efforts. So, you know, you've got a challenge-based program and essentially what you were talking about and we all, operate on an open call, right? So how that fits all of it, all the pieces together, considering also the military space, is gonna be a, uh, an interesting 
pro proposition for us to make it all fit together and make it make sense so that as the people who are providing solutions is you have both options, right? You can address a challenge or you can come through an open door because we all know, you know, D&D might have a good idea of 93 challenges, but what if there's one technology that's out there that nobody knows about? So I think there's a collaboration between the three programs to how did this make the most sense for innovators? And I think that's where we're going. It'll just take time to get there and make sure that all of our programs are aligning in the right way. Or Eric or Amber? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty exciting time, as you mentioned, and a few of us are newer programs than, you know, BCIP, um, but we have a very collaborative relationship for the, at the moment, and I'm sure it'll only strengthen as time goes on, so we're really fortunate for that. Um, if you notice how our booths are actually set up just around the corner, we're one beside another, one another, so I think what we're focusing on right now is also making sure that we have a clear message to innovators on how these programs could potentially work together and how they complement one another, so we're really lucky that we we have this relationship already established, and I think it'll only grow and foster as the years go on. That's great. Eric, any yes, thoughts on that? Yes, we have uh, talked many times in the past, because we regularly, uh, I present before BCIP, they present before after us, or ISC, uh, and we've already discussed potentially in the future, as we've been saying, to make it easier for the innovator, maybe to have, for example, uh, a single web website, so people would submit an idea, and internally, we would decide where we'd be going but we're not quite there yet. I mean, we just started, so we're, we're, the discussion is open. Uh, eventually, we'll get there. Okay, any, any questions from the audience since we have the panelists up here for a few more minutes? So, um, so if I'm an SME, um, what's the best way to engage with you? I know that there was some emails, some websites, uh, some Twitter accounts, uh, you talked about advisors. So advice for the crowd here, what's, what's the best way to sort of say, hey, I have an idea, what should I do? How, how, can, how can we help navigate the SMEs? Because that's often a, a comment that we hear about the innovation programs. On our end, reach out, right? So we have, uh, we have a website, obviously. You'll have a phone number on there. There's an email address. Uh, we also, on the BCIP side, we're, we are an open call. So a lot of times is we have to walk through what is innovative about their solution, right? We want to give them input on, sometimes it's how to think about your proposal in an innovative way. So we will come out and meet with individuals and companies one-on-one, -on -one. whether we set up a session at OCE or we go to, you know, I was at the University of Toronto on Friday. We'll do one-on-ones, could be essentially B2G meetings. So we want to make sure that you're applying with clarity on your application. So if you have any subjective thoughts about a question in the form or you're not sure about your eligibility, reach out to us and, and I, we are very quick at responding. Sure. So I have two quick points. Um, I don't think you can go wrong if you're reaching out to any three of these programs. We have an understanding of all three of the programs. So if you send us a question and if it's better with BCIP or ideas, we'll make sure it gets to the right place. Um, but what I'll do is I'll take the opportunity to mention very quickly um, a platform that was recently launched that could definitely help you in navigating the programs that are available um, in terms of the innovation space. And if you, don't write, if you don't write it down, there are cards just at our booth. So once again, I'll ask you to come and visit us. But the uh, platform is innovation.canada.ca. And it's as simple as that. And what that platform allows you to do is go in and ask, answer a few questions that relate to your business. And that tool will actually filter all of the results in terms of innovation programs, federally and I believe provincially as well, that apply to you but also that have funding currently available. And we've been getting some really great feedback on that tool. And also if you have any questions, I believe they also have uh, an email address that you could submit questions to and they'll make sure it gets to the right program as well. So once again, that's innovation.canada.ca. And as mentioned, you can email any three of these programs and we'd be sure to answer any of your questions. That's great. Yeah, Eric? And for ideas, well, as I said earlier, that little card gives, us, gives you our, our, our um, webpage address. All of our challenges are there. Uh, all the information about when they open, when they close. And also, there's a future opportunities uh, uh, place to go and check what's coming. Because we like to inform people about the next challenges. So we have six coming in the next three months. So have a look, and you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, wait, in July, there's something for me there. So I can prepare for that. And we'll try to keep that uh, future part uh, as, as, uh, as long as possible and, and to, to to, uh, to look at the future as, as, as far as possible. But as Amber said, we're really well connected and when things don't belong to us or, or wouldn't work well with us, we'll work with the others also. Okay, 
Last call for the last question. No. <gasps> uh, so um, my question is, can a university researcher apply as well, or do you have to be a small business to access any of these three programs? Um, I can speak for B for BCIP. Yes, absolutely. An individual can an individual can apply to BCIP. Uh, they would just require to become a business in order to obtain a contract down the line. But for initial application, yes, that that's uh, that's fine. Uh, so for Innovative Solutions Canada, you must be a, a business. You must be for profit business. But as Eric mentioned, if you if there's an incorporation that spins off of a university, that's absolutely welcomed. And also within our program, um, even if a company applies, there's an ability to partner throughout the program that allows a portion of the funding to go towards partnerships such as research institutions, universities, and colleges. So I believe in phase one, it's one third of the funding can go, and in phase two, it's up to 50% of the funding. So it is quite flexible. And for ideas, we're open to everybody. So be academia, a small business, big business, the guy in his garage, I mean, non-for-profit. Uh, so it's all there. Okay, that's, that's excellent. So we'll, we'll wrap up the session. So uh, some of you had asked about the, the slides. Uh, the slides will be made available as the presenters have given OC permission to post them, so that's great. So thanks again to uh, Eric, Amber, and Eric and May. Really appreciate your insights this morning um, as representatives of these programs. Also, they're available at their booth. So just walk out the, the theater and it's, uh, it's, uh, it'll be to your, your left and you'll have more opportunity to ask some, perhaps some of your more in-depth questions. So this concludes our um, federal innovation procurement session. So thanks for joining us at the next theater. We hope to see you later on this afternoon as there's gonna be a presentation more broadly about talking about doing business with government and that begins at 2.45. In the meantime, the luncheon and awards uh, ceremony is beginning in Hall F and that's uh, just in a, a few minutes. So I encourage you to make your way there and enjoy the rest of Discovery and thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you.